Warmly welcoming you back to ThinkTech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. This happening to be the 242nd show, and the views are about to be 19,500. We appreciate that. And today's panel is, because it's a follow-up on last week, is us two, you, Jay Fidel, in your Nuano uh, um, recording studio. Hi, Jay. Hi, Martin. Thank you for having me. Uh, a pleasure. Thank you for being on and me a couple blocks away down there in Waikiki. So the ThinkTech transitioning, Jay, gives us the opportunity to have more sort of pre-show and post-show discourses, which is great. And we want to share with the audience our post-show reflection that got us to uh, talk about that architecture, as you said, you gave me as to think about and the audience architecture is where we live and live means human event and activity and what we do as humans, right? And you were saying, Martin, who you are, I continue to talk about it's because of, you know, my father and and you said i was lucky and certainly i was and jay the my my high school friend i was talking about gregor um was in a little different situation because he had a, a father who was uh you know more well off i mean me as a son of an you know self-employed architect it's always kind of ups and downs you have commissions it's good you buy a new car there's no, you know, following commission, you sell it again. It was never really a problem. We always had to eat and the roof above our head. It wasn't a problem. But Gregor, I said, his father was a honorary consul of Panama. But in his first job, he was uh, he had a bank, a private bank. So his father then, the, the car we showed, the Lincoln Mark III, was was built from 69 to 71 but not to get that wrong as we were sharing in the show quote in the top in the middle there comparing automobiles and architecture number volume seven if you want to know more go back but just the gist of it is that his consultants talked to him uh, that he was driving an old beaten up bug and his consultant says you got to have a car that meets the standards of your peers which were big mercedes's and and Rolls Royce and, and BMWs. So he bought that Lincoln Mark III, but not new, but old and beaten up. So he said, there you go, I have a bigger car than my peers. But he kept his integrity to not being become a victim of what I call substitute satisfaction embodied through a status symbols. And that gets us to, to architecture and others, because he said others we're not that lucky, right? And expand on that because we see that here. Who is that and what is that about, Jay? And what does it have to do with architecture, particularly concrete, because you did a preview of this movie coming up soon. Well, you want my reaction though. First, I'll tell you that when you talk about Gregor, I always think of Franz Kafka, uh, who, who wrote Metamorphosis, uh, the story of a fellow who woke up one morning as a, as a cockroach. His name was Gregor Samsa. And it's an interesting kind of Zola-esque scenario where he has to deal with, with being a cockroach. Um, so I'm sorry, I, I don't know any other Gregors aside from Gregor Samsa in Kafka. Um, but the other thing is, uh, you know, you can go the other way in cars. And um, I certainly have. And I drove a, a, a string of Volkswagens until nobody else was driving Volkswagens. Nobody. Um, and the reason I did that is I, I wanted to stay away from Porsche. I wanted to stay away from Mercedes. I wanted to stay away from Cadillacs and all the, the cars that are status symbols in, in our lifetime. And the Volkswagen was just fine for me. And now I drive a... Uh, what do you want to call it, um, a, a very plain uh, Honda Civic. And, and that's the way it is. And, and, I, and I do this intentionally. I want to make the opposite statement as the guys who are looking for status symbols. That's my reaction. Yeah. And I, to add on, Gregor, not a cockroach at all. His last name is actually Baum. And now he's exposed. Sorry, Gregor. I hope you're fine. And Gregor is actually Jewish and his father was. So we Germans have been horribly jealous of that as we all remember and should never forget. 
And it's a great example of the humbleness of Jewish, of not showing off as your point, versus some Americans, as we see the one on that throne here, uh, and, and that's the point of the movie coming up, that's depicting T. Rump, and uh, that he was not that lucky because he had a horrible father, as it was your point behind him, and so had Elon Musk, and that's why they get so along with each other, because they, they lick each other's wounds, right? And you were finding out in the review something, and I say it, if you don't want to say it, uh, I'm just quoting you, you said, Martin, there's an interesting scene about architecture because the Trump Tower, another status symbol of actually male capital concentration through erection, through a tall phallus symbol piece of architecture, male domination of capital concentration, it is not made out of steel, predominantly, as the tragic, to that regards, World Trade Center was, uh, but out of concrete because uh, the mob was involved. So, Jay, on the left, we see us here in Kaka'ako. That is not any different as far as the embodiment. These are big concrete bunkers. These are actually the two Howard Hughes really tragic attempts to build for the people. These are the two social housing projects. And that is, you know, not quite as, you know, the same as being bad, but at the end, unfortunately, not much different. I'm going to switch to uh, the site we've been talking about, and this should get us back to Jimmy because that's how the show is called. This is going on down the street here where DeSoto chips in, and we're going to do a back-to-back -back, uh, switching with Human Human Architecture and this great new show, uh, How Did We Get Here, from next week on. And I'm referring to uh, his last one about the very provocative, and that's why it has rightly so 1.1K viewers already, because you can't have a more provocative term, the destruction of Waikiki, right? And regarding that side here, um, De Soto reminds us that um, everyone was actually kind of very hopeful of this young uh, developer, Hameter, because he, to begin with, was not doing a high rise and as hideous as we said, this kind of King's uh, you know, village alley project was, but it was not a high rise. Well, soon after, Talking megalomanic, I guess fame got into his brain and he went the other direction that everyone was already curious with a Hyatt right next to it. And now things come full circle and his little humble, if you want so, beginnings also gets high rised with a timeshare. And, you know, who is sharing the time there? Certainly not the people with the money, with the people who don't have the money, right? And right now, sort of almost ironically, you see what they do for safety for pedestrians um, is giving shelter to the people. You see one urban nomad there. That reminds <laughs> us of Jimmy hammering houses for Habitat of Humanity, a top left show quote. And DeSoto also chips in, hey, we actually had a little museum branch. The Bishop Museum had a little museum branch in that little development. And then there is two quotes here about um, how talking humbleness and what you possess, Jay, and as you said, strategically what you own. Uh, the Hameter Estate, uh, this is already a couple of years old there. We're talking 9 million and 12.9 million out in Kahala. We're talking Jimmy up there. And this is already 10 years ago um, when he was in his early 90s. He was and still is living in the house he built himself a long time ago, which is 0 0.16 million, $160,000, which is below the average. And this is exactly like you with cars as a status symbol, is he with buildings as a status symbol. There we go with a comparison of automobiles and architecture. So now our pre-production discussions we have go going on, you sent me this here before the show and you highlighted things. So talk about that. What caught your attention in the article of the Society of Architectural Historians about this building, Jay? Yeah, I mean, I told you when we spoke offline before that I was not impressed with Jimmy Carter's presidency. Remember, he was a one-term president, that's all. And uh, Ronald Reagan beat him good at a debate. Ronald Reagan was uh, inexperienced in politics. 
relative to you know so many presidents but um he was a great debater a great communicator and he'd been governor of california so he knew well enough how to handle jimmy who was very good in that debate but not good enough so he lost in 1971 he he was out of office um and his, his notable contribution if you want to call it that was that he surrendered the panama canal to panama which was, um, I suppose, consistent with the the liberal changes that were blowing in the wind at the time, um, the global move against colonial holdings by major nations, and so, um, and there was, um, you know, a problem in Panama because people were protesting the American presence. So, uh, but that marred his presidency because the U.S. had spent plenty of money building it. And now we gave it away for nothing, for zero dollars. So to go on to his uh, architecture, I, you know, you mentioned that Jimmy Carter had some architectural notions, and I didn't recall him for that. I recalled him for other things, but not that. And um, <clears throat> come to find that he was very sensitive to architecture, and that he cared a lot. And you know, presidential centers are built after the president leaves office. So if, you know, and of course, they have a lot to say about their libraries, uh, where and what it looks like in the architectural concepts. And so what we are looking at is uh, Jimmy Carter's taste, which was something. The article I sent you talked about um, his efforts at mm, building homes in, in many places. He and R Rosalind, Rosalind built a huge number of homes for, for disadvantaged people, not only in the U.S., but elsewhere. They did it with volunteer labor, and but they did it with Jimmy Carter's concepts um, here and elsewhere. It's, it was quite an amazing contribution. He was a philanthropist in many ways. He was a super liberal, super caring, may I use the term democratic uh, philanthropist. But one of the things in that article that I think I would like your view about is, is circles. Uh, as circle as a as an an element in architectural design, uh, he liked that, and he and he built projects using that. And he was, I guess, you would say, I would like your opinion on it. He was ahead of his time. He was ahead of his time in, a mu in multiple ways, but also in architecture. Your thoughts? Well, my first thought is Jay. You just proved why one has to watch these shows which are only to encourage everyone to uh, follow our research method and being curious and continue to learn, right? And, and never think you know enough because every day, you know, getting better every day is your slogan. So you just proved it and you just demonstrated it how it's supposed to be. So regarding his presidential library here that we see here, that was built right after he concluded his one and only term. And um, it's certainly in style classicist. There's a show quote at the very top left of us a while ago. This is not to mistaken with a silly and sick uh, classicist uh, T. Rump way for federal buildings, as we call cynical classicism. This is to be called, as we said, cultivated criticism, uh, classicism. And criticism is uh, Ron Lindgren, who built probably the best uh, classicist building in all of Honolulu, which is the Hali Kolani Hotel, a few years later in the mid-80s there. So in this uh, article here, the architects are mentioned at the bottom there. And the first names, uh, the architects of record, Jova Daniels Busby, they sound very sort of, uh, you know, um, Georgian, you know, Auli guys from there. But the other name is Lawton, Umemura, and Yamamoto. That sounds different, right? And when you do more research as this year, we always give you the link so you can look it up yourself. In the Washington Post from 86, it unveils, it says that these architects based it on an initial design by Hawaii real estate developer Chris Hemeter. There we go. And also talking capital concentration and not being free, as your point, that architects are never free, right? Because they are relying on uh, clients, right? And I always said, 
actually, we shouldn't educate architects. We should do this too, but we should actually do a school educating clients. We'd probably be more impactful because you can unfortunately do architecture without architects. It happens a lot, you know, others can sign off the drawings, but you can never do architecture without clients, right? So that's why we need educated clients even more and even better. And if, if a developer buys an architectural firm later, there's trouble, right? My father, again, always said, um, you know, I need to be serving my client in a free way. And sometimes I need to uh, disagree with my client only to, uh, you know, that he later agrees when he realizes because I'm the expert. And we even did this for the federal German government building military where you came from when you came to the island, military facilities that they, after we were done with them, they didn't talk to us anymore. And so many years later, they came back and apologized and thanked us because they realized we knew better, right? When, when you are owned with your company by a developer, especially one that we look critically at, just like, you know, uh, with Jimmy Carter, we take a critical look at Chris Hammeter because there were many things that were kind of questionable about him. Uh, you are not free anymore. You're basically a slave of capital concentration. So when you further do your detective work, I looked for the architects. What pops up is a lot the presidential library and not a lot more, but this pops up. Jay, this brings back memory. This is a flashback because this is from back in the days, 1973. There was, an, there was a magazine by the American Institute of Architects local chapter uh, in, in Hawaii. And in this uh, here in November 73, these two architects on the left here were joining that as new members. You can see how young they look. And then a couple pages further is this here. And I want to, you can all see what you see, but I want to read out what's the caption down there is we elect to embellish the Hawaii architect each month with a structure no architect could improve on starting this month with a lovely Sharon photo by Jerry Hauser, well-known architectural. This would be impossible these days, rightly so, with Me Too and racism and sexism and all these things, right? But I just throw out for discussion isn't this lovely? The only thing I would say in all fairness, uh, in the next issue, there should have been a picture by an uh, equally fully uh, uncovered male uh, with all its parts been taken by a female photographer, then we would have equity. And certainly I see the grin on your face, uh, the lovely Sharon, uh, the audience please goes back a couple of shows, it's very personal to, me, to you. And I want to move on unless you want to say something at that point. My lovely wife often says, Martin, you are living in the past and in the future, but not enough here. And I keep trying to make my case and saying, well, sweetheart, um, I just don't want to be the narrow in Rome, you know, see Rome burning and just throwing an orgy party to enjoy myself here and now, which, yes, I should probably do more, sweetheart. But I need to make sure I'm going to do this and everyone else going to do this uh, for the next future as well. And in order to do so, we need to pull from the best examples from the past. So that being said, I, I googled more. The only other thing that pops up by this Yamamoto, who then you know left Hemeter because he didn't want to be enslaved, did this building here in the Molaili Molaili uh, neighborhood here. And it is from the 90s, which is an era that was dominated by this Gerhard Schroeder guy on my German side, who was a pretender, to say the least, because he turned to Putin after that. And Clinton was running. And I'm not quite sure about how you know, honest he was on his side. So these were days that were kind of sketchy in their own. And given that, this architect was doing a pretty good job. This has big lanais, right? This is trying its best that we don't do these days anymore, Jay. Unfortunately, we always have to shed a light on what's going on these days. And that is unfortunately horribly on the other side here. This is what you find on Eisenberg Street, which is just down the university, just past King Street. There's this development here. This is DHHL, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, going tall. And uh, when you go on these links here, you see the developer, Stanford Carr, 
and his architect, in-house architect, talk about it. Talking uh, the topic of this show, I find this the most inhumane and, and unhuman what's been doing here. And, you know, some five years ago, we called this warehousing the workforce, and it's not any better. There is no outdoor connection. There is no lanais, right? You're going to be shoved away in these things for the few hours that you need to recharge your energy to have these multiple jobs to make a living here. This is really bad. So getting our hopes back up about the circles, as you talked about. So this is the this is a, an aerial view of the of Carter's library, and at the very top, you see from Wikipedia even opens up and says, "Well, Jimmy was uh, was friends with both who you mentioned, uh, with uh, Ronnie, and with Jimmy, uh, and obviously, you know, um, Jimmy, um, you know, uh, kind of returned the favor and actually uh, got Hammer to be involved." And, and um, you see here the high ego of Hemeter. By the way, I should add, uh, DeSoto also said about the Hyatt, where Hemeter very soon, five years after his little start with a little village there, he went megalomanic again with a, with a Hyatt. It was first called Hemeter Center, talking about ego, right? A Trump Tower. And we see here, besides all the good things, we see the Carter Center, Hemeter Pavilion. So we go here. We go again. Maybe it wasn't quite that selfless as we, as you said, sort of Jimmy was, and and besides being classicist, actually the circles, uh, Jay and everyone, uh, come across as more futurist. And here from the Carter Library itself, a, a, a kind of a further indication because who was president when Star Wars, talking futurist, came out? And he watched it three times with a staff in it. That was Jimmy. So, um, talking classicist, futurist, that's what we would have, could have gotten around um, Barack Obama talking presidents, having spent most of his youth growing up here. And this looks pretty cool, literally and figuratively speaking, right? And it's a site that's very familiar to us, Jay, because we did many shows about Kaka'ako Makai down there, the area of you. That's where it was supposed to be. And it looks, you know, open, easy breezy, a big lanai. You got everything you need. This looks very Hawaiian. And uh, if you say that was wood, what you saw above yourself, uh, there's a precedent for it here, which is the Outrigger Canoe Club by Osipov and by Pete Wimberly. And it has this wooden ceiling that's we call side nail timber. And that, by the way, uh, speaking about the next week coming, while Jimmy is going to turn 100 tomorrow in a week, uh, our beloved Richard Lowe, we're going to remember in his memorial at the Outrigger in coming Friday and then the following Monday, why we're not going to have a show, uh, his punch bowl ceremony. And so uh, that is uh, what we could have been excited about. And the architects of this ones are big shots. They're called Snow Hedda, and they're out of Norway. And I once in my prairie days in Nebraska had the chance to get to know and befriend one of the principals the other bald guy you see behind me there, uh, Craig Dykers. And Craig Dykers asked us to uh, see something that he credits his architectural heydays or inspiration that back then, get it, a Norwegian guy has an Omaha, Nebraska girlfriend. And she, uh, on one Sunday, dragged him to something she saw when she was walking the dog or she went for a walk. That was a guy, his name was Neil Estley. He was an architect and even the director at my alma mater, School of Architecture, University of Nebraska-Lincoln, that, by the way, I was never told, neither as a student nor as a faculty, go, go figure. And he was just building in the same way. You know, they, it's a pile of two by fours that you put together in a very virtuous way. And we just had just done the the school for disabled children. Do you see top left show quote at the same time? So we both got excited about not so excited, Rich at the bottom left show quote looks when he was giving his Docomomo talk story, and that was at WCIT, Bob Iopas, that hosted the event. And they had up the Blaisdell um, um, exhibit part uh, renovation or, or rebuild, and that's what you see there. Um, we 
Jay never ever went on uh, doing a counter uh, cultural pro proposal, but so many years ago here we did for that. Instead of building that blobby, megalomanic, self-obsessed kind of monster, we suggested to just do a neutral kind of background uh, that we thought would be way more better actually in line with with Craig's initial coming out project at the very bottom left, which is in his hometown of Oslo, um, the Opera House, which is very, very proletarianly public because the roof can be inhabited by the people and they put up a big screen for the one who can't afford to pay the big ticket. And then when he was at the, uh, what was it called? The, um, the big Art Deco building in downtown Omaha, I'm blanking, the first Norman Foster building. And he then added to it recently, maybe that was part of the event he had there. But he played this YouTube about this motocross guy, uh, you know, riding his motorcycle on there. And he saw that as a proof of evidence, uh, which it was. So I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed because what do we get? We did these tons of shows about that we get this imported stuff from Chicago high rises all over the place uh, looking the same as in Chicago. And what does Chicago get from us? We talked about that a little bit some shows ago. We actually give the presidential library to Chicago uh, with Barrick, who built it there where he made a career, but where he didn't grow up. And we had in these two shows kind of shared my experience that a quarter of a century later, I ran to his architect and I thanked her for having been critically constructive about using materials, not as a decorative screen. And uh, some of my colleagues and friends said, you know, when she was sharing that, uh, you know, the meeting she has with her client and Barrick pulls out his pen and is doing redlining because everyone wants to be an art, wanted to be an architect, right? Even if they didn't became one, that must be pretty horrible talking control freakishness, right? And some said, you know, maybe that sort of, you know, problem with materiality became a self-fulfilling prophecy because she was sharing with us, well, things that were supposed to be out of wood all of a sudden turned into concrete. And the concrete has to be licked and sticked with stone, you know, which in Chicago, you got that, you got that frost and thaw, which, sorry, you wouldn't have had here. So... Just to say, and you know, one more time going to the guys, the guys who persuaded her that we were okay was Massimo Lano Fuxas, who is now an octogenarian fellow as well. And he basically made the point to say, what about all these ideologies and, 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 and in best case philosophies, isn't it just about give me shelter? And I told you, this is the building that has informed me the most because in Lincoln, Nebraska, it's by the architect of of, of the Kennedy Library by IMP that we have the beautiful dormitory from. So back then in 2008, uh, this is me on one street in Lincoln, Nebraska. So, you know, since we have the university, it's a little, well, it's debatable because we know how important that state is in the current politics, right? With its, with its political system, but let's still, you know, be hopeful and say it was and will continue to be the blue island in the Red Sea and all the magazines were about a dream fulfilled. So that's obviously when Obama took office. And this is, don't get us wrong, this is proving Einstein's theory of relativity. Because only people uh, you had trust in can disappoint you. And people you never even had any hope in, they can't really disappoint you. So um, Barack Obama, we're unfortunately disappointed because out in Waimanalo, not only did he build himself a pretty big mansion with a seawall, you know, retained that he shouldn't have, but also talking, getting the fame to the brain, he took where the former Magnum PI, the original with Tom Selleck, that's why we put him here twice, you know, that was all filmed. And, you know, people coming here and affording themselves helicopter cruises, they were told by the pilots, you know, oh, down there, that's the Robin Masters net. Why did he have to take that house, right? Again, is he more important than, uh, than, uh, than uh, Magnum PI? He's important in a different way. But, you know, you guys, and that again, back to he's going to build a library or a center, which is a good thing. And Politico up there says from T-Rex, we might not even get one, right, ever. 
because the way he ticks, you know, so that puts it again in perspective. Beric, we're talking relatively criticism to absolutely a happiness that we had with you and, 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 and T-Rex, we can't even have, have any kind of hopes. Hopes gets us to that Jimmy said, I'm going to stick around. I'm gonna, not only going to turn 100 tomorrow in a week, but I'm going to hang in there another month to November the 5th, and I'm going to do what the big headline here says. And he's going to join, uh, obviously, Taylor Swift and Billie Eilish up there. I threw in because the Pope isn't much of a help, which is what he was saying, with a lesser evil. Um, I did the homework. Uh, the myth says there was once a female Pope that was Pope Joan, and we might need one of these again, right? Of the many things, Jay, you said that um, we, did not, we do not think of Jimmy that way, that's at the bottom because uh, also about 10 years ago, he was invited as a keynote speaker for a woman TED conference. And they invited him because they said, of all men, you are the one who did the most for our rights. So this is where things kind of come full circle here. This is just to reinforce what we have said before. Dear Americans, dear fellow Americans, do, do uh, not be afraid of a woman leader. There's some funny, you know, crossing paths with who many say is until Kamala hopefully becomes it, the most powerful woman in the world. This is Ursula von der Leyen. Um, that, you know, we, did we agree to begin with when we met her, as you see here, you know, um, with my dad next to her and they flirting with each other? Um, no, the, we did not, not agree. Did we absolutely agree when we departed? Likely not either, but we had a great discourse and we both grew out of it, right? And your great newsletter at the bottom there, there is some criticism of everyone. Only people who do things, right, and mean well, you can criticize them. And there's some criticism about, uh, you know, her as well, but that's relative. So that's why I dragged this into the teaching. Um, I was told I'm not supposed to talk about politics and I'm not interested. I'm also not talking about politicians by that, but I want to talk about being political and that the young generation has to step up again, right, and talk. As we had down there at the bottom, Neil Abercrombie once in a review and he brought his, you know, homework with a Honolulu that he did his PhD on and he was prepared you know, and you have John Wahihi on shows all the time. And we had Alfred Price who stepped down from his office to basically become a policymaker. You know, in the arts and architecture program, he initiated that. And that we can still see Diamond Head and it's not cluttered by capital concentration. Um, you know, high rise manifestations is also he is to be credited. So to that point, I want to get to something um, uh, uh, current to wrap up here, what we're addressing in studio, and this is probably a little bit notice, Jay, but we're going to have the review with the students. The soda's going to be there, and if you don't have anything else to do, which I know you have, you can join us too. I know you have something very more important to do, but so we will inform you. So that's what we want to address. There is this, uh, uh, there is this uh, thing out there where a developer talks about the conversion of this former high-rise into housing, and you know, he uses this sort of language, typical developer language, and then he throws out the three letter uh, recipe. Oh, we went to San Fran and we got to SCB. This is the Solomon Cortwell Bunes firm that we get invaded by, who then did a, a, a windowless bedroom and did not look that bad. Uh, they made the sliding door out of opaque glass, so you get some kind of light. And so here is our mid-century modern classicist master, Ron Lindgren, up there at the very top left, right, who is a founder of his firm, Edward Killingsworth, had done housing to begin with in the 60s with a Harbor Square project, right? And, and Ron shared with us that, you know, some of the students' proposals to turn this building from, uh, from commercial into residential were much better you pointed out to me someone that you think highly of, and I can see why. That's at the bottom. That's Christine Camp, because Christine Camp stepped in, and then she actually kind of did a follow-up, or I would say kind of a rebuttal um, of the developers who did that. And why she did that is because she took on another project, which is uh, the Davis Pacific Center by Steve Au, and they kindly gave us a tour and explained what they're doing. 
while generally meaning well typologically, right? And basically saying, um, we're going to, you know, have more people live. That's, they didn't think better of how to do that. And talking can't build a concentration. It reminds me of as if I would be like an organically grown tomato, right? And you made tomato paste out of me and you, you squeeze me into these tubes, right? That's what you do with people here. Again, this is sort of, you know, chopped up in little profitable pieces, $400,000, um, uh, the least as a minimum. And then you come up with a different spin of that, you know, trick to justify, you know, bedrooms that don't have window frontage. And they call this a signature glass wall. That reminds me of like a double aquarium, you know, and a, and a fish. I'm just, you know, I want to catch breath, you know, and, and not just the looks. We're over obsessed with the looks the breathing of fresh air. And while she is right down there, as she brands it, the greenest building is the one that already exists. We couldn't agree more on that. But the emerging generation up there at the top left at the beginning of the semester looks rather puzzled. And we're thinking, couldn't, shouldn't you do better? And this is where it all kind of concludes with these very kind of Lewis carroll -y little bits and pieces is here that, you know, this building was done in 73, right? That is just the year before that lovely article in the uh, Hawaii Architect, you know, um, with this sort of wonderful naivety and just being, you know, so kind of free and open and, and innocent in a certain way. That's when Steve did that in 72. And I think only because of the corporate nature, there were signs of sort of decadence coming. And, you know, certainly then Nixon was the embodiment of that. But architects still you know, fought against it. And we're not like, you know, uh, McGarrett in high Y5, old Jack Lord there, you know, absolutely inappropriately dressed, right? You should have the Hawaii shirt that you wear. Um, and so, you know, we, we need to uh, revive the pure essence of these sort of, you know, free days. That's the point. And uh, we need leaderships, right? On all levels, on the national level with the president who runs us, and also the president who runs our academic institutions, right? We have a president search going on. And don't worry, there's no megalomanic starting to go on with Martin. I was not on that newspaper. I, you know, ironically, humorously put me up there because I was in a Docomomo board meeting and I had my, my head shot up. Um, and a, guy, a fellow member was saying, Martin, you look like as if you know something that we don't know. So I went back to like this old picture of mine. How was I looking there? And I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the two finalists there and I'm thinking like, again, were they like the, the, the journalists? Were they doing this sort of like um, without knowing or without thinking? Why do they have a smiling woman there and kind of a suspicious looking guy? Which doesn't mean, you know, that's already saying something. But, but again, you know, look deeply into the candidates. And, you know, for the longest time, I wanted to delete this uh, talking newsletters I get by Hawaii Free Press because it's not the direction I am uh, like to see things. But um, I watched several shows of when you had the, the guy on the, on the show way back. And I forced myself, even though it's giving me pain to read it, but I need to because I need to expose myself to how other people basically think. And they already pitched this here and basically saying, well, you know, here is, uh, he is talking about equity and equal rights and here is someone who is not, which is her. So again, don't go get caught up, you know, in, in anything. And obviously don't judge by any sort of pre prejudice, right? Nor might it be race or gender or nothing. Look at everything in, in the way that I think this concludes, as you, you know, have said, you learn through these shows. You look at Jimmy, that not everything he was doing while he was president, but after the fact and as a post president and where his heart is you know he has he always came from the from the right place so that's uh concluding this rant um uh please uh let's not leave it with that but have some last concluding thoughts from your side jay mm, i have so many thoughts and i so appreciate um you know all the all the incredible content you put into these shows but some thoughts about what you've been talking about. Number one is uh, on Jimmy Carter. When he was president, they 
they attacked the American embassy in Tehran, and they, and they kept they kept the American officials there for virtually years, and they did not release those officials until after Ronald Reagan was uh, sworn in, like like just a, a few weeks after he was sworn in. They were, you know, ticked off at the U.S. because of the way the U.S. handled Iran and the Shah of Iran, uh, who was in many ways an American construct. Um, and and then, of course, uh, to release what kind of a statement is that to, to release all those hostages just a few weeks after Carter left office? It was a, it was a huge humiliation and insult. Um, for them to do it that way, and I'm really sorry they did because I don't, I don't think he deserved that. But that was no. that was one thing that we have to consider when we consider the efficacy of his presidency. That's uh, Hemeter is the other thing I was trying to remember. Hemeter, you're right. He became a if he wasn't already a megalomaniac, and everything he touched was um, kitsch or uh, extravagant or worse. And um, gee whiz, I mean, that was not at all Hawaii. Whatever projects he did were not Hawaii projects. He was as far away from Hawaiian architecture, Hawaiian sense of place, Hawaiian sense of environment as anybody alive. And it, it is really remarkable that he was able to get any projects done with that approach. Sad that... Um, you know, he went the direction he went because you have to recover those projects later. You have to re redesign them. The third point I want to mention is the Davies Pacific Center. I spent 95% of my professional life here uh, in the Davies Pacific Center. My firm was there for years, decades, and, and we saw it. We saw it evolve. Uh, we were, we liked that building. I mean, as an office building, and we liked the way it worked, and it it worked well. It had been designed as an office building, and it worked well as an office building. It to me, it was a very classy office building. Now, Christine Camp is doing what she has to do to preserve the building because it can't last as an office building, as you know. Um, the commercial tenants downtown, the office tenants, are declining. Um, that's the way change works. There's nothing so inevitable, unchanging as change itself, right? That's what you're always talking about, and that's what is happening to downtown. And she has a challenge to take that Davies Pacific Center and make it into something that is sustainable. <clears throat> so uh, I grant you the floor plan may not be optimal, uh, but she can't rebuild the building. And also, I don't think the community can leave the building as an office building. Uh, it ultimately has to get converted. And um, I'm very curious to see how she does that. Um, but I but I feel a nostalgic feeling for that building. And I and I would like to see it, you know, become more sustainable. Finally, yeah. those uh, local architects you mentioned who had the photograph of, of that woman in their in their brochure. You know, that was a statement of the was 70s, was it? It was a statement of a new emancipation. Uh, call it, uh, you know, uh, a freedom of sorts. And um, I, I don't think at the time they, they published that with that woman, who was really beautiful. I mean, you know, we all have to agree that the female form is beautiful. Uh, arguably, the male form is also beautiful, but hey, this that was a beautiful that was a beautiful woman, a beautiful local woman, and uh, I I commend them on doing that. But I understand that at the time they did it, there was this revolution in sexual freedom, um, call it gender freedom, if you like, um, that was happening, and regrettably, we don't really have that anymore. But I think we can look back to it and say, gee whiz, um, there is a connection between beautiful uh, free architecture, free architectural concepts, concepts that are organic and that uh, reflect how people think and where the community really collectively wants to go and the form of that woman. There's a connection. It's not, it's not um, you know, disconnected. And so I think there's a statement there, and and we can look back with a certain amount of nostalgia as to how things worked in those in those days. Yeah, and 
And two two responses I have to make, Jay, all spot on. The first one, and they actually have to do with with everything too. So I mean, you were around in your prime time when you know Jimmy uh, was running you, representing you, and I was just barely born. I was born, but I was just very young. So everything talking nostalgia comes from uh, you know what I want to believe, <laughs> but it's uh, I gotta watch out. I don't get sort of romantic, right, about it. But some of the information I heard from time witnesses has actually to do with um, the architect Steve Au here, who was the one who designed. And I think as far as a match, uh, um, you know, Jay, as we're saying, in best case, you have a perfect match between the one who has the money and the one who does the best with the money. When they are totally synced, right, that's the best. And I wish, you know, Steve Hamming been such a humble guy. He wasn't a self-promoter. That's why he didn't even get to, like, you know, hammer it. He was probably sucking up again to Jimmy Carter and then got his foot in there. And thanks to Jimmy, this didn't turn megalomanic, right? And as in the things that 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 Hammerter did himself. But I think the perfect match would have been the two. And I tell you why, because Steve Au in this uh, in this video that Bundit did with him shortly before he passed away, actually decided to pass away after consultation with his family because he had terminal cancer. And they all said, we want to remember you in the best and not going down the drain. That was his decision. So Bundit, thank you, Bundit, did this interview with him that you please watch. There's a show quote down there. And towards the end, uh, he basically says... Um, uh, uh, giving is better than getting. And he says, you know, I've been to so many Buddhist gurus and I'm impressed by with how little they're happy. And this goes back to your choice of car, right? You're happy. This is a choice. You do it because you recognize the bigger the car, the bigger the, the footprint is environmentally. You know, all that stuff needs to be mined out of the ground to put in, into the body of the car, and then it needs more fuel and all these things, right? So it's a conscious, conscious decision that we make. And going back to Jimmy, so parts, I mean, uh, ways to look at the hostage thing is something I always found interesting, is that it was told Jimmy maybe intentionally risked to be re-elected because he actually could have been doing what Americans then wanted and choose Ronnie the cowboy to do and show, it's always about, oh, men need to be powerful, right? That's the problem because he showed manliness in, in not uh, escalating the confrontation, being diplomatic and trying to negotiate. And when he finally was getting close to being successful, um, you know, for various reasons, the people didn't believe him in anymore. So Ronnie then actually on his first day in office could say, hey, I freed the hostage. But all the way getting there, right? So maybe Jimmy again was happy to give more his presidency than to get. And that gets us again to Steve Au uh, with the same thing. That is the most humble architect. And he's also the one who then Bundit got close to him. When we're doing this book that we're currently working on, this tour guide, we're categorizing it. And I wanted to put uh, Steve in the category of a hippie. And I, since he's not around anymore, you know, Bundit, who's the closest to me, I said, what do you think? How would you feel about it? And actually, uh, Bundit says right on. He said that about himself. So it's is this sort of free spirit of the time, right, of, of the 70s that we encourage the emerging generation to redux, to revive? Because I believe on this building here, and this is the newest Intel news. I'm, I'm not so sure if I'm supposed to say it already, but everyone knows me. I say it anyways, right? So the newest uh, uh, trend is for Christine and her team is that actually uh, now the conversion into uh, little slices of paradise uh, for half a million dollars and way higher isn't going so well either. So they're thinking actually to do, which you rightly say, if something has to be done, actually goes to more hotel, which has also been a trend in, in downtown. Now I'm saying to the emerging generation, because I heard someone with expertise in the area, how about hostel versus hotel? There seems to be a demand in the market for young travelers 
right? And the Halliman Noah by Pei, the architect of Kennedy's presidential library, there we go again, has practiced that in Manoa, and I've experienced that my first week here. So, and, and, and how about you just centralize the kitchen around the core, you keep the bathroom centralized, you save a ton of money, right? You can make this really affordable, and you have people coming through wanting to experience the real Hawaii, not the fake Hawaii, as I think you very correctly depicted Hemeter, the real Hawaii together with people who, you know, need to uh, live here in a more decent way. And you get cultural exchanges and you can actually do this really affordable. Everyone talks affordable, but you need to change your mindset. So that's what we're doing and, you know, confronting, provoking the young generation. We're hoping we get new leaderships who are going to be with us. Not only is the president going to be new of the university, we're also going to have a new dean. So wish us luck with, with all that. And until then, Jay, we better conclude this here. So um, until we see each other again, which again, for the reasons mentioned, won't be next week. It will be the week after. But we as DeSoto Brown with this great new show, uh, How Did We Get Here?, and then following up on that one, we do human and humane architecture within that rhythm. So hopefully you're as excited about that as we are. And until then, thank you, Jay, having been on the show and everyone watched it. And until then, please stay human, humane. Mm -hmm.